Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, so let me just quickly introduce the speaker. So uh, it's great to have Han Yan. He uh, received his PhD in University of Okinawa. And um, um, if I understand correctly, now he's a postdoc at Rice, uh, work, working with uh, maybe Andrei Nividomsky. Yeah. Uh, Han works on uh, quantum magnetism, maybe classical magnetism, and he is interested in this um, topic that became quite popular recently that has to do with fractons, which uh, some of us here are also interested in. So we are very excited to hear about your research, Han. Okay, thanks a lot for having me here, Andre, and thanks for, um, to everyone for coming here. So let me start sharing my screen. So I need to be enabled uh, to share my screen. Just a second. How about uh, how about now? Okay, it's working now. Okay. Um, so you can see the slide and you can see the mouse. Yep. Okay. So let's start. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for coming. So um, I'm Haiyan, and I'm uh, now a postdoc at Rice University. And today I'll talk uh, uh, one of my work on realizing this rank to you once spin liquid with frustrated magnetism, uh, which is based on this paper. So let me first acknowledge my collaborators, Owen Benton, Ludovic Schopen, and Nick Shannon. Uh, the, so um, the main result is in this paper, and uh, we have also two earlier papers which um, built up the technical tools that we needed uh, also by the th same uh, team. Okay, so, um, so let me start. So the title is um, well, realizing rank to you one spin liquid with frustrated magnetism. So let me start by explaining why this spin liquid and also the rank to you one physics are interesting. So um, let's start with something that everyone knows, the Ising ferromagnetic model. So we know how it was Hamiltonian like, and we know that the effective theory has this change of shape at a critical temperature, which lead to the change of the phase. So generally, these classical matters are um, explained by this Landau paradigm, which is a recipe um, that tells you that look at the symmetry, which determines the, all the parameter. And also, uh, you can write down the effective theory that respects the symmetry based on these other parameters. And uh, the, in the different phases of the effective theory um, have different um, say condensation of the other parameters which determine the phase you are. So this recipe not only works for the simplest icing ferromagnetic model, but uh, pretty much all the classical matters that you can think of. So however, this sort of paradigm of classifying phases of matter based on symmetry and all the parameter, uh, I think it was revolutionized um, in the past few decades when people realized that there are this so-called topological order. Well, the simplest example of a topological order is the toric code, where I have this lattice of, uh, say, spin halves uh, living on the links. And uh, my Hamiltonian is this uh, vertex term, where I have four Sx multiplied together, and I have this uh, plaquette term that has four of this SZ multiplied together. Okay, so what is the ground state for this? First, if you want to satisfy all the A terms and uh, you draw all the say, X, SX being plus one half to be red on the lattice, then to, to satisfy this A terms, um, the, this red links have to be connected as a loop. Um, that is, on each vertex, you have even number of red links. So any, any of this closed-loop configuration 
um, will um, minimize the energy of the A terms. And then to minimize the energy of the B terms, you actually have to have a superposition of all these loop configurations that can be mapped from one to the other by the B terms. Okay, so on the torus, then you have actually um, several degenerate ground states. For example, here I, 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 I have shown two ground states where the first one, when you make this cut, you have even a number of things going through this cut. And uh, for the second ground state, you have odd number of things going through this cut. And uh, these two states are not connected by these uh, B terms. So they don't talk to each other. They don't talk to each other. So they are two separate ground states, but they are degenerate. And this degeneracy is actually robust. It cannot be lifted by any local small perturbation. Okay. So here, there are something that's fundamentally uh, different from this, um, from this classical methods I talked about. Um, okay. For example, uh, sorry, let me, I cannot, uh, okay, yeah. Um, for example, there's a massive, the, the ground state now is very quantum. It's a very massive superposition of the classical loop states. And the phase is really characterized by some topological number rather than some other parameters. Because all the parameters here are actually zero. And the degeneracy is protected and you have long range topological entanglement and so on. Also the excitations, uh, which are these ends of the string operators are effectively electric and magnetic charges. If you think of this, um, this vertex operators as some kind of Gauss law obeying uh, constraint, then this string operator will violate the uh, Gauss law at the end, which creates the electric charge. And uh, uh, in, in a similar way, when you violate the B terms, you can have the magnetic charge. So these uh, excitations are fractionalized because they are at the end of these strings instead of uh, being like a spin wave. And also they have some non-trivial breathing statistics. So um, all these features are something that you do not see in um, say conventional classical phases of matter um, that can be described by the Landau paradigm. So instead, now we understand this is something called the topological order, which is uh, very intrinsically quantum. And um, it's something that's really different from the classical phases of matter. Now, why spin liquid? So these topological orders are extremely interesting as quantum phases of matter, but then how do we realize it? So essentially, spin liquid is a way to realize these topological orders based on spin systems. So there are these classical spin liquids. So essentially, what they do is to realize the classical limits of the topological orders on the spin system. If I use the Tori code as an example, then a classical limit will be I have um, only the A terms. So each of this loop configuration is a single ground state, okay? So you have a massive degeneracy of these classical ground states. So experimentally, even if you can realize these classical states, uh, classical system with this huge local degeneracy of the ground state is already non-trivial. And then a quantum spin liquids is to realize this fully quantum topological order on the spin systems. So very often what you want to do is that you realize this classical spin liquid first, where you have this massive um, ground state degeneracy, and then you introduce quantum dynamics, which will, uh, you know, link uh, link all these different um, different classical ground states, so that uh, so that eventually, uh, effectively, what you have is some uh, topological order, and your true ground state with the quantum dynamics will become this kind of um, loop superposition. Okay. And, uh, 
And how does spin liquid or how does spin systems realize this classical and quantum spin liquids? Well, one, one of the very effective mechanism is called frustration or frustrated magnetism. So how does it work is like this. So imagine I, I have an icing model on a square lattice with antiferromagnetic interaction. Then I can place my spins in this staggered way so that each bond reach its lowest energy. Okay, so in this case, there is no frustration because each bond is kind of satisfied. However, if I have a different kind of lattice, for example, a triangular lattice, then uh, I want to place the spin up and spin down on the triangular lattice and, uh, and try to lower the energy of the system as much as possible, then I cannot, um, uh, you will see that you cannot do it on every bond. So for example, I put spin down and up here so that I can lower the energy of this bond. But then for the third spin, um, I actually don't have a preferred choice. Uh, no matter it's up or down, so there will always be one of the bond that stays in the high energy states, okay? So as you can imagine, if now this is just on a single triangle, and if now I have a network of these triangles on a triangular lattice or on a, say Kagome lattice, then I will have a lot of these undetermined spins. So um, it is very hard for the system to develop any spin ordering or develop any order parameter uh, actually. So, so your spins are always fluctuating, but in some correlated way. And this is exactly what the classical limit of topological order looks like. Now, uh, perhaps the most known, well-known example is the spin ice. So the spin ice is based on this tetrahedron, which is like um, basically a 3D version of the tri triangle where you have um, the spins pointing in or out toward the tetrahedron center. And the ferromagnetic interactions um, also cause this frustration so that you will have a two spin in and two spin out as the, the ground state for a single tetrahedron. But of course, you have many options to choose which two spins to be in and which two spins to be pointing out. And you can put this tetrahedra together to form this so-called perichlor lattice and you have a network of these spins and uh, on each tetrahedron is two in, two out, but uh, there is a huge degeneracy or there is a huge redundancy in how you can organize the spins to satisfy these conditions. So this is called spin ice. So the ground state is the two in, two out ice rule obeying state on each tetrahedron. You can actually think of these uh, vectors as your electric field. Then uh, this two in, two out is actually saying that my ground state is to have a um, charge-free condition on every single tetrahedron, right? So the ground state is the electric field obeying the Gauss law. And then you can have the excited states where you have say three in, one out on some tetrahedron. So that will be equivalent to having some electric charge sitting inside this tetrahedron, and uh, uh, which violates the Gauss law. Okay. So what's why people like spin nice is because there actually has been quite a few experiments that uh, realize this um, this uh, spin nice in a real material and. Uh, so from what I described, you can see that this uh, classical spin lines is actually realizing electrostatics or the classical limit of U1 electromagnetism on a piece of crystal. So for example, uh, this is uh, HTO is one uh, material that um, is a quite accurate realization of spin lines. So this is the neutron scattering uh, experiment which measures the eco time spin spin correlation. And uh, so, experimentally, how do you identify this spin ice? Is to look at this kind of singular feature, which is called pinch point. 
And they are very universal and character characteristics because uh, if you think about the ground state, which is some kind of divergence-free law on the some emergent electric field, then this actually put a constraint on the um, correlation between the electric field components, say EI and EJ. And you will find that uh, this correlation has to obey this projector form so that this condition, uh, this divergence-free condition is always uh, satisfied. And this projector form, when you take out one component, it look exactly like this, which is, um, it's a, it, it is actually singular here and it has a different value uh, depending on which direction you choose. So this is called the pinch point and has been clearly observed in the experiment as an evidence of the uh, spin nice material. Okay, so that's more or less the story for a classical D1 theory realized in frustrated magnetism. And uh, uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned, you can add some quantum dynamics that flip some of this closed loop in this uh, spin nice configuration that will give you um, quantum spin nice, which is realizing a quantum electrodynamics on your lattice instead of just the electrostatics. So that is what gives you a genuine topological order. And there have been some experimental progress in, in discovering this quantum spin nice material as well. Now, um, um, can I ask a quick question? Maybe yeah. for some of us who are not as much of an expert on this. Um, can you just say a couple of more words um, how to calculate this two point function of electric electric field in terms of spin variables? So like we switched to this electric oh, field see. analogy. But in the end, right, we're describing something about the spins. Like, how, yeah. how, what is the relation? Yeah. So, um, so this E, this electric field is essentially some linear superposition. Um, it's basically the sum of these four vectors at a single tetrahedron level. It's the sum of these four vectors. And uh, as you can see, it can point in several different directions. And if you cost green your system, your uh, the E is um, is is cost grained and become more continuous. So so it's, the essential thing is that this E I E J correlation is nothing but some linear combination of the spin spin correlation uh, S I S J mm -hmm. when you take different I J channels. And uh, what neutron measures is also a uh, certain linear combination of these spin-spin correlations, uh, SISJ, and they are summed with some, some factors. So, so since the pinch point exists here, it means the pinch point exists in some of the spin-spin correlation channel. And when these spin-spin correlation channels are measured by the neutrons, so that's when we, you will see this. Um, do I, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. So, so let's move on. So this is the uh, conventional U1 uh, spin nice story is pretty nice. But now we want to do something more exotic, which is called this rank to U1 spin liquid. So um, this rank to U1 is basically a generalization of the conventional U1 U1 electrodynamics. So here the electric field is a symmetric tensor field. Okay. And uh, as you can imagine, um, the, the correspondingly the gauge field, the gauge transformation, and how you define the charge and what's the magnetic field are all correspondingly modified. And there is a rather consistent recipe to do every all these things. Um, but to just to mention what is essential for us today, um, when you chose, for example, the definition of charge, there are different uh, choices. For example, you can have this uh, scalar charge defined like this. Um, you can also have this vector charge that's defined like this. And on top of this, you can choose your electric field to be 
either traceful or traceless. Okay. And actually, uh, what we want to realize today is the last one here, where you have an electric charge and uh, the tensor is traceless. And at low energy, this, uh, this charge is free, is zero everywhere in your system. So we don't care much about the magnetic part because we are only looking at the classical sector. Now, why are these ranked U1 theories so interesting? So the early motivation of developing them is because um, these symmetric tensors mimic the perturbation of your space-time metric. So people were actually discussing how this rank to one uh, electromagnetism is actually mimicking gravities and gravitons in a way. Uh, but more recently, people become excited because um, I think it's Michael Pratko first realized the charge excitations in these theories are immobile, or at least they have some constrained mobility, and they are called fractons. So the reason is, for example, if I look at this um, scalar charge case, then this condition, scalar charge-free condition, will imply that there is some charge conservation in the system, and in addition, some dipole conservation in the system. So now if you have a charge isolated in your lattice, you cannot move it because moving the charge will change the overall dipole of your system. So, and this is forbidden intrinsically by, by definition of this rank to one theory. And so, so the charge is really immobile. And, but you, you may have this quadrupole dynamics available or these quadrupoles are not conserved. So when you have this a dipole, it can move because moving a dipole only changed the the overall quadruple moment of your system. Okay, so this is a rather bizarre behavior, um, and uh, and people realized that um, these fractons are also featured in this so-called fracton topological order or fracton quantum order, which is a bit like uh, the conventional topological order, but also quite different in the sense that the robust ground state degeneracy is, um, is the number is the exponential of linear size of your system. And that's highly non-trivial, right? Because it depends on the geometry and you have a massive number of um, de degenerate ground states that are robust, that are protected. Unlike in topological order, you only have a field depending on your uh, the, the genus of your manifold. Okay, that's that's one thing that get people quite excited. Um, and also um, starting from these fractons, people realized that, um, for example, you, this dipole conserving dynamics have quite a lot of uh, interesting um, have a lot of interesting implications in physics. And uh, I think you have several local experts that, are, that did some quite nice work on this, uh, on this field. And also um, um, one other interest of mine is to understand its connection to um, gravity or holography, which I did some other work on. So, so this, all this stories on the theory side is very nice, but it comes with the cost that um, these prototype models are usually very complicated to, um, to realize in experiment. For example, for the X cubed model, which is a fractal model, it has 12 spin, in, 12 spin products as an interaction term. And, and that's basically uh, impossible to realize in the experiment, right? So, uh, so experimentally, we want to find something that is uh, more experimentally realistic to help us realize these fractal matters. Uh, for example, realize this classical sector of rank to one theory. And uh, so what we find actually quite surprising is that there is a very simple model to realize this. So this model is called the breathing perichlor model where you have the perichlor model, but you have this up pointing tetrahedral and B well, let's call it A tetrahedral and B tetrahedral. Um, and they can now have different interactions 
because you break some inversion symmetry of the lattice. And in our case, what we want is just Heisenberg interactions on both A and B tetrahedral. And in addition, you want to have some of this jelginski maria interaction on A tetrahedral. And uh, this is actually not a lot to ask, um, as I will show later. And then uh, in the large n limit for this model, you can develop the effective theory and you will find that um, the active component is a symmetric traceless tensor that act as the effective electric field. And uh, they are, it's a spin liquid and the, this electric field are fluctuating, but their fluctuation obey a vector rank to U1 Gauss law like this. And also experimentally, there is a very clearly defined um, signature to look for it if you happen to make this material, uh, which is this fourfold pinch point. As you can see, it has four of these wings instead of two. And this is um, identified to be a signature of this rank to U1 Gauss law. So let me explain how this happens in a bit more detail. So let's come back to the spin ice and look what happens here. So for spin ice, I have only the local FZ component um, interacting. And uh, so in the large S limit, I can just think of them as some scalars. And this two in, two out ice rule become just a requirement that on each tetrahedron, the sum of the SZ have to be zero. Okay. And then you can rewrite this in terms of the uh, cost grain field theory, and this becomes the divergence free Gauss law for a vector electric field. So here, notice that I have one copy of electric field that's made of one component, only the Z component of S of the spins. Okay, now let's think about instead just the SZ interacting. Let's think about the Heisenberg point where you have. Um, X, Y, Z components all uh, interacting in, in the same way as spin nice. So now in the large S limit, what you have is the sum of S, Z to be zero, but also X and Y have to be uh, zero when they are sum. So that is, you have actually three copies of Gauss laws from the X, Y, Z components. And in the large S limit, they are uh, they are actually actually um, independent from each other. So that is to say you actually have three copies of U1. It's U1 cross U1 cross U1, which in the more compact form, I can write as, as divergence E alpha is zero, where now this alpha is X, Y, Z. It just tells you if this E comes from the Z or X or Y component. So now I can change this alpha to J as a um, spatial component so that this thing can be written in the more compact form. Partial I E I J is zero. Now this looks very nice because this is indeed the definition of a scalar charge or the scalar charge being zero to as the ground state of your system. But there is one problem which is this E I J actually has all it's nine degrees of freedom instead of being symmetric or traceless. So the version we cared about has the same Gauss law, and but it the EIJ needs to be symmetric and traceless. So how do we do it? Now the idea is that um, this U1 cross U1 cross U1 is a very large local degeneracy as a classical spin liquid. And this rank to U1 degeneracy is actually a subset of it. So the idea is that we introduce some more interactions that will gap out the undesired degrees of freedom and leave only the desired degrees of freedom from the Heisenberg point. So this is like um, having a big boulder and uh, chipping it away, chipping the unwanted part away so that you have a nice sculpture coming out of it.
Okay, so just to repeat this idea again, in the in the limit of u1 cross u1 cross u1 is a fully free three by three matrix, and uh, we want to introduce some potential term that that looks like a e anti-symmetric part square plus trace e square, so that uh, these terms will be gapped away, and then what's left is a symmetric and traceless tensor. And in the meantime, uh, although the free fluctuating component here is changing, the Gauss law remains the same. So they are enforced by the same term here, which does not need to be modified. So this is possible on the perichlor lattice, because as we will see later, that the symmetric, antisymmetric, and trace, these three components of this tensor happens to be ERAPs of different symmetries, okay? So that means you actually have the freedom to manipulate, man, manipulate them individually without affecting the others. So in principle, you can tune the Heisenberg model to do it. Now, more concretely, this is realized by just adding a jaloginsky maria interaction on the A tetrahedron. So let me explain how this happens. Now we look at this um, breathing perichlor as a, as a network of this A tetrahedron. And then this A tetrahedron are connected by the interactions on the B tetrahedron here, okay? So what we will do is that now we think of A um, it, we think of this A tetrahedron as our unit where this um, electric field EIJ leaves, okay? And then because each spin is shared by both A and B tetrahedra, that means anything on the B tetrahedra can be written in terms of things surrounding it, in terms of this EIJs surrounding the B tetrahedra, okay? So starting from this Hamiltonian, we want to see if this thing can arrive. That is, on the A tetrahedra, I have the potential terms that I just talked about, which will gap out the anti-symmetric terms and the trace terms. And in the meantime, on the B tetrahedra, I want to see if this, um, uh, this interactions on the B tetrahedra can actually be written as, uh, as this term, which will uh, impose the Gauss law of the vector charge. Of course, here I omitted some coefficients just for um, better clarity. Now, how does this happen? So this gets a bit more technical. So on the tetrahedron, you have four spins with three components for each spin. And in the large S limit, essentially this 12 degrees of freedom become uh, independent scalars from each other, okay? And then um, on this tetrahedron, you have the interaction matrix uh, between all these 12 components that respect the symmetry of the perichlor lattice, which is some um, generic Hamiltonian. And this, this Hamiltonian, uh, in this representation, it looks like a mess. However, you can do what Landau did. You look at what are the um, symmetries and you find the uh, irreducible representations of this symmetry, or that is you find the order parameters associated with each symmetry so that this mass of Hamiltonian will become diagonalized. So the EREPs are written as this M fails. So the, each of these are some linear combination of the spin components. And once you write them in this nicer uh, ERAP or other parameter way, the Hamiltonian become diagonalized, like you have only ma2 square, me square, mt2 square, and so on. So this is our, the, what the Sorry, M is. I have a quick question. Yep. So the symmetry that you talked here, is, is this a rotation of symmetry of the spin? It's the it's the lattice rotation. It's the lattice rotation symmetry. Um, so and the, the symmetry of the the tetrahedron. 
Yeah, the yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so these are the what the other parameters or EREPs look like, but you actually don't need to care about this. Um, so now if on the A tetrahedron, I have only the Heisenberg interaction, then diagonalizing the Hamiltonian, I find that the Hamiltonian is nothing but this mt1 plus square. So that is to say, if I have some fluctuation of this mt1 plus, it costs energy. But for all the other fields, um, they, are, they don't appear in the Hamiltonian. So they are actually free to fluctuate, right? So if now I just forget about the B tetrahedron, I only look at this uh, active fluctuating components on a single A tetrahedron, it is um, these things. And uh, there are, they have in total nine components. And uh, if you write them together in a nice way that respect the symmetry of rotations, they look like this. And this is exactly the nine, the three by three matrix that's fully free we talked about. Now, I turn on the jalajinsky maria interaction here. What happens is that now in this EREPS, the Hamiltonian looks like this. It has this T1 plus square, but it also have this A2 square and MT2 square, okay? so. Of course, with some coefficient that I omitted here. So that is to say now, uh, not just the MT1 plus is killed by the Hamiltonian, but also the MA2 and MT2. So they, are, they have to vanish for at the low energy sector. And only the two component ME, and sorry, this is a vector actually, M, M, vector MT1 minus are free to fluctuate. And these five components, happen to be the symmetric and traceless parts of this, um, of this matrix. So what happens is in the, in the Heisenberg antiferromagnet point, your freely fluctuating field is something like this, three by three matrix, which give you three copies of U1 uh, Gauss law. And when you turn on the DM interaction, it kills ant the anti-symmetric part, it kills the trace part. So what's left? fluctuating is just the symmetric part. Okay, so we have done the analysis for A. That is, um, if now I forget about B, then just having the A Hamiltonian means I have this symmetric traceless tensors Eij fluctuating on the A tetrahedron. Now, um, you can do more or less the same thing we did now on the B sub tetrahedron. It just, it's just a Heisenberg interaction. And uh, if you write it in terms of this E, back, e uh, tensors, it will look like this. Or more um, systematically, it actually looks like this. Um, or it actually required this to be zero. But, um, but essentially, um, now this T2 and A2 components are gone. You see that it only left a uh, constraint on the E and T1 minus fluctuation, which is the fluctuation of this uh, EIJ. And, uh, and this is exactly the partial I EIJ being zero. In other, way, in other terms, this, this term, if you write it in terms of EREPs become um, a char uh, potential for any charge excitation in your system. And this is how uh, you have the both pieces. First, you have the correctly fluctuating degrees of freedom. And second, you impose the correct Gauss law on them. And now you get a vector charge to rank to one spin liquid. Okay. So the, the analysis is, is a bit complicated, but in the end, the Hamiltonian is quite simple. It's just Heisenberg interactions on both A and B tetrahedra, and then a bit zalojinsky maria interaction on the A tetrahedra. Now, experimentally, how does it look like? So as I mentioned before, when you have this vector charge-free Gauss law, it will impose this projector form 
on the EI EJ correlation. Okay, so which has this pinch point feature. So now you just have a more complicated version of it that now this EIJ is a tensor. So now this uh, correlation EIJ EKL will have to obey this rather complicated form of uh, projector so that um, uh, the traceless condition and also the uh, vector charge free condition is satisfied for, for this uh, correlator. Um, if you take out a particular component, say you take IJKL to be XY, XY, and look at its distribution, it has four of these bright wings in this four perpendicular directions, which is called, called a fourfold pinch point. Um, proposed by Pram and the uh, collaborators in this paper. So uh, just like the pinch point is a characteristic signature for conventional uh, U1 spin liquid, this is a characteristic signature for rank two U1 spin liquid. Now we have done the uh, Monte Carlo simulations for this classical O3 spins on uh, on the on the breathing perichlor lattice we proposed. And as you can see on this spin flipping channel, you can actually quite clearly see these fourfold pinch points at these uh, high symmetry points. So in non-spin flipping channel, um, they, some, they just happen to, to not appear. And this is the fourfold pinch point that's um, in the zoomed in view. Also, you can extract this EXY, EXY from the spin components. And uh, from the Monte Carlo simulation, you can see the numerical result of their correlation. And indeed, they have this um, fourfold pinch point form. Now, uh, for the phase diagram, uh, if we have equivalent JA and JB being negative and tune the value of DA, then this rank T1 spin liquid uh, actually leaves on uh, uh, mostly at a finite uh, temperature window when the DA is negative. So at higher temperature, uh, you can, as you can imagine, this DA doesn't matter anymore compared to temperature. So it enters this Heisenberg antiferromagnetic phase, which is the three copies of U1. As you lower the temperature, some of the degrees of freedom get frozen and you enter the rank to U1 regime. And finally, um, at a very, very low temperature, there is actually an ordered phase um, because now we're using O3 spins in instead of large S spins. So uh, it may drive the, the physics into somewhere else. Okay. So this is where the rank to U1 lives. Now, uh, one particularly ex uh, encouraging point of this model is that um, this breathing perichlor model has actually been experimentally discovered. For example, this material barium ytterbium zinc oxide has been studied in quite some detail. And uh, what's nice is that um, for the A tetrahedron, where you need the um, Heisenberg interaction and the dialoginsky moray interaction, um, for this particular material, the A tetrahedron gives you exactly what you want, okay? And that's very nice. But unfortunately for this material, the B sublattice exchange is very small. Um, so, so it's not exactly realizing this, but I think it's at least showing that um, such a material is in principle very likely to, to be created in a lab. I think also um, another perspective based on these techniques we developed is that you can actually design spin liquid using this breathing perichlor or breathing bipartite structure. That is uh, one of the units, you design what are the freely fluctuating degrees of freedom. And on the other unit, um, you design what is the emergent Gauss law that's imposed on them. So that you actually have um, quite a lot of freedom 
to, to design the spin liquid you want. So in fact, for breathing perichlor, there are a lot of other options we didn't uh, document. Uh, we did document one of them um, in an earlier stage, uh, which is to have actually, um, now it's a fully symmetric, a fully, fully free tensor, has all its nine degrees of freedom. And the Gauss law has a vector charge free condition. And, in, and additionally, there is um, another Gauss law, which uh, looks a bit weird like this. And for this one, it will have these pinch point features. And these pinch point features locate actually on all these red lines continuously in the Brillian zone. So just to show that um, this method can be used to design a lot of other spin liquid. Is now, it not rotation? Is example? Sorry to interrupt. Is this example not rotationally invariant? No, uh, because yeah, I think this is yeah, this is breaking the, the rotational invariance. Yeah, but down to some uh, point group. Yeah, down to the point group symmetry of the perichloral lattice, which is a cubic symmetry. Okay. And yeah. uh, what is the constraint? Is there a mobility constra constraint that leads on this? Um, that, that, that comes from this? Actually, we didn't, this is a very good question and we didn't look, look at that. So we actually had this paper before the uh, Michael Pratko's fracton paper. So, so at that oh, point, so. we, we didn't know the mobility constraint can be very non-trivial, but that's a very good question. and. Um, Maybe we should just take a very curious example because this tensor it's a right it's absolutely symmetric tensor of rank three, right? Yeah. This absolute value of i j k. So that's yeah. something doesn't come up in uh, normal quantum field theory ever because no. it's uh, in the representation of C of cubic uh, symmetry. That's so right. Yeah. It's it's something very very unusual and interesting. I didn't know about this example. Sorry. Okay. Paul. Cool. Yeah. So if you want, we can maybe talk about this later. Um, yeah, so on open problems, first, of course, uh, we, want, we would like that um, this material, this model can be realized in some material and from this non-material example given, it's, it's not uh, entirely impossible. It's actually quite realistic. And also um, what we did is just realizing the classical sector of rank D1. So then there are questions of uh, what happens if you take this model to be quantum. Um, so there are some, some related work that appeared recently um, by these people in Toronto, where they also studied breathing perichloral lattice, but a quantum model in, uh, for a different uh, parameter set where they find some uh, subsystem, emergent subsystem symmetry in this perichlor lattice, but at a more quantum level. And uh, the third thing is that um, also part of, sort of inspired by this, you know, carving the big boulder of uh, U1 cross U1 cross U1, is that you can have um, some kind of partial confining of multiple, multiple copies of conventional U1 and uh, from there, you can get a uh, rank to one. So that's also like a general recipe that you can use to, um, to build other models. For example, if you have two layers of 2D one, then perhaps you can build a 2D rank to one. And uh, yeah, so these are some of the open problems that are still there. And uh, so, so I will conclude my talk here. So the tech take home message is that for this uh, relatively simple breathing perichlor lattice, you can actually realize um, classical limit of rank to U1 theory. And uh, there is some very clear experimental signature to look for it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, that was an awesome talk. Um, questions? Yeah, I have a question. A few questions actually, very interesting talk, thank you. Um, so you had the, the uh, rank, rank two symmetry tensor gaze, and basically you can also have the charts in the lab mode of this thing. 
but from your um, your presentation, I have the impression that you cannot make the the, the monopole. You, you can only make dipole. Is this correct? So you have something like going in and something going out somewhere. So we have my like two n. If you yeah. want to make. Okay, so for you um that's true. So locally you can create only so okay, so coming back to spin nice. Yes. Uh, locally you can only create a pair of uh positive and negative charge because yes. you have charge conservation, right? So if yes. you want to have a single charge here, you have to say extend the string to infinity. Yeah. yeah. So um, from from the symmetric checklist tensor gaze, you know that uh, when you create a dipole, then the dipole can move perpendicular to this to its uh, to its dipole moment. Yes. So then, like, can you like like do a simulation to see that it can happen, or, or like, can you do like numeric to see that happen? You 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 don't have the the monopole because of this idea, but you have the, the dipole. And if your theory is correct, then basically the dipole can move perpendicular to its direction. Is this possible? Okay, so uh, so first I think it is possible. Although this is not the, the movement, it will not come from dynamics. It will come from just the Monte Carlo updates, at least classic. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And also, I want to say that um, uh, for this uh, for this rank to you one model, you actually create a quadruple of charges because each eij is connected to four of this b tetrahedra. So when you change just the eij on a single set, you will create yeah. a quadruple in your system instead of a dipole. This is different from the spin nice case. Okay, that's yeah. correct. And another thing is that uh, you have very nice, uh, uh, have very nice uh, um, proposal to, to to realize this using the correlation function of the uh, symmetric tensor gauge, symmetric E E I J. Yep. Um, but here you have both A and B uh, block. So in experiment, if we want to measure the Spin correlation function, we use uh, the, the, the neutron scattering, but here we don't know uh, where it comes from. It comes from B or from A. I see. So since, um, well, since each spin is shared by A and B, so it's not so but, clear. But, but we... the point is that the E and J only live on, on A, yep. only live on B. Right, but 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 when you do 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 neutron scattering, you will need to see the. the yeah, the, I see. So uh, let me explain it. So EIJ uh, is a particular combination of your spin component, yes, right? yes, yes, and it it looks actually quite complicated if you write it in terms of the spin components, yeah. and. Uh, so EIJ will have, so say EXY, for example, will have the clearest signal of this fourfold pinch point. But, but in new, when you do neutron scattering, you, are not you cannot measure this EXY, EXY directly. Yeah. Uh, you can only measure some other linear combinations of these uh, this spins. So then, what happens is that. Uh, but, 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 but I thought that you, you can measure the correlation function that. Like spin in x direction correlation with a spin in y direction, something like that. So basically, you still can 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 have can make sense of this EIJ, right? Um. Okay, so you may you can you can access say part of the information I would say, because okay. in the end for neutrons, um, you are you can only uh, measure a particular linear combination of this uh, s yes, s components. Yes, and uh, so, so then what happens is that um, uh, you are, so in this big linear combination of these spin components, some of them actually have the fourfold pinch point. 
because some of them come from this EIJ. And then you have also a bunch of other things. So uh, you may or may not be able to see the fourfold pinch point. Yeah. And so what we did is use the Monte Carlo simulation for the, for the spin system to directly simulate the neutron scattering signal. So then what happens is that for the spin flipping channel, which is a particular, say, combination of the spin-spin correlation, you can see it actually. Mm. Yeah. Then, of course, it is possible, as you mentioned, that um, because you are also measuring a bunch of other stuff, so this uh, fourfold pinch point could not may not appear in your neutron. Yeah, so basically, you can like measure here. like spin going in in x direction and measure the responding spin in, in y or z direction. So have more yeah, more yeah, something like that. So, so you, so yeah, for example, in the non-spin flipping channel you may be just unlucky that you don't see the fourfold pinch point yeah. because there are some other fourfold pinch point that like um, on, lay on top of this and cancel, cancel this out. So yeah, this may happen. And if you, that happens, you, well, that's just unlucky. Uh, so I want to mention that it actually is the case for spin ice as well. So as you can see, this is the uh, non-spin flipping channel for spin ice, and uh, they actually don't see anything in the non-spin flipping channel, which is also a, some spin-spin correlation. They only yeah. see it in the spin flipping channel as well. Yeah. So, and, and also in the total channel, then it's, it's not, it's actually not very clear. Yeah. So yeah, so, uh, so what, what you ask is potentially may happen, that uh, you happen to don't see these fourfold pinch points. But in our case, we're lucky we can see it. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? Hey, I have a question, but I didn't think uh, much about it. So maybe it's really stupid. Um, so the spin eyes kind of became part of popular culture after um, uh, magnetic monopoles were discovered, uh, right? Did you yes. think about magnetic monopoles for this uh, high rank theory? Um, yes. Um, oh, yes, and I thought a bit about it, but um... Um, so in, if you want to have monopoles in this case, uh, so first the spin ice monopoles are actually the electric charges in, in the language I use in this talk. Okay. Um, um, and then if you want to talk about this, so now because I'm talking about the large estimate where all these things are continuous, so that the violation of this, um, electric field is a continuous value. So that is your, say, fracton mm -hmm. charge is a not quantized, it's continuous, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, my experience is generally in this case, it's a bit hard to uh, track the movement of them because they can split into smaller vectors and, and go their own way. It's easier to talk about them when you have a more a quantum model where say your spins are quantized. So the violation of the Gauss law is also quantized. So you have a well-defined quantized fracton and you can track its movement. Um, so this has actually been done um, in, in this recent archive preprint by a young by Kim's group. Uh, but they studied uh, a different model um, where, where you have, you can, you can actually solve this model in, in the quantum limit. And then you mm -hmm. have this well-defined uh, fracton excitations and, uh, and they actually studied how these uh, fractons propagate in the system. Yeah, so, so in principle it's possible. It's a bit difficult in the context of our work, but if there is a very well-defined quantum model, then it, it's doable. And in fact, uh, understanding these dynamics of 
uh, quantum fractons or even just the quantum monopoles in this quantum spin ice is a quite a challenging task. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Maybe I can ask the last question. Yep. Um, so basically, uh, you have the gap list phase of uh, semi switch tensor case, and basically you can have like E squared term and and B squared term, right? Yeah. So here you can think we only have the E square and the rho square. So B, having the B square means you have dynamics which we do not here. You do not. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 then uh, from the the Hamiltonian, the microscopic Hamiltonian, you also be able to derive the coefficient of the E square term, right? Um, that's right. Yeah. So 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 basically, the the, the correlation function here also can measure the the coefficient that 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 come from the mic microscopic theory. Uh, I think so. Yes. So can can one have some like experiment idea how to match this? Mm. You mean measure the e square or I mean when 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 you have the probability of e square, then basically you measure the coefficient of, of, of e square term in, in your action. Because it's a propagator, right? Yeah. And and basically the coefficient of this e square term, you can also get this when you cross grain your 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 uh, your your spin I mean, yeah. it come from j and d and, and j j i j b and d so yeah. like can can someone like make the the, the mapping i think that one can yeah At that numerically uh, yeah that numerically. yeah i think that can be done um so one way to say this is if you change J, A, yeah, change J, B, J. and D, so this pattern will we change, have yeah. some difference in like the overall scale or the distribution will have some difference. And, and that's say a result of different, the different E square. Yeah. yeah. Maybe it's more more interesting if you have a dynamic, but I think that is really yeah. Having having dynamics, yeah, we would like to have that. It would be uh, very nice to have dynamics. So you have a rank to one electrodynamics, and that's that's yeah. going to be a huge improvement. I yeah. I agree. Yeah, but um, okay. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Very, very Thank you. Yeah. Okay, if there are no last questions, which there aren't. Okay, well, thanks a lot for the talk, Hang. Um, it was awesome. Um, thanks a lot. I personally learned a lot. Yeah. Maybe I'll write to you a little later about stuff that you mentioned. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, okay. everyone. Bye bye.